So I'm going to read you a tribute I wrote for Michael. Uh, almost 30 years ago, about 1978, going into the faculty club at UBC, I noticed a man older than I who had an air of youthful panache about his informal but tasteful clothes. He was alone. I asked if I might join him for lunch. By all means, absolutely, said Michael. That was his instant response. We exchanged names and at once I realised that I'd happened upon the English translator of Max Frisch. He translated the fire raisers and also I'm not Stiller. It turned out that Michael Bullock was a distinguished full professor in the Department of Creative Writing. I was just an associate professor at the time, but this was not a matter of importance for Michael. More to the point was what a person did, and whether that person was on the side of life and creativity. When he knew that my earliest published poems were on a Japanese theme, that I wrote poetry, come what may, despite academic pressures to publish academic books or perish, uh, we became firm friends. And this was a friendship as instructive as it was delightful, teaching me about Michael, of course, because you couldn't meet Michael without being aware that Michael was Michael. <laughs> and, um, but it also taught me about the necessity uh, for continuous work if you want to be a writer. And it taught me about surrealism in writing and in art. And Michael read my early poems, not with criticism of theme or subject, but of diction. Diction. Every word in a poem counts. Good lyric poetry cannot tolerate padding. Michael's own work, however fantastic, however spontaneous, however obsessive, is always lean and spare. Michael, prolific translator, of some 200 works from three languages has had his own work translated into Chinese, Japanese, Indian and other tongues and of course distinguished translators of Michael's books into Chinese are here with us today. Furthermore his abundant and astonishing words have also changed. Things I read when he was alive I sometimes half understood. Now I'm older and I find that a dead man's words have an extra resonance for the living. I want to share with you a stanza he wrote in a book of poems called Erupting in Flowers, 1999, that book. It comes from a poem called Lament for a Vanished Lover. To me it seems infinitely touching just now, here in Vancouver. The image of your presence is wiped away by the truth of your absence. The arms that could have held you like a sheaf of wheat close around brambles. Thin trickles of blood form the notes of an inconsolable lament. Here blood becomes music. Michael, like a wizard, changed one sense into another following the sensibility of those French poets turn of the century that he loved. In Michael's work anything can change into something else, making for incredible adventures, sometimes funny, sometimes grotesque, always surprising. His transformation seemed to make many variations on Shakespeare's surreal song of changes, given to the spirit Ariel in The Tempest. Full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. Those the pearls that were his eyes, nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Michael was born near the end of the First World War, lived through the Second and beyond the murderous Cold War. He lived through the lethal and the benevolent developments in shipping and submarines, aircraft, tanks, artillery, automobiles, 
<coughs> astronomy, space travel, typewriters, computers, paints, felt tip pens, radio, television, the fax machine, cameras, the cinema, video discs, and all the trappings of our contemporary existence. Despite his knowledge of the wickedness of some of us earthlings and of the dirty devices of this world, he maintained his joy in life, his personal optimism and jauntiness, his good humour, his <laughs> benevolence. He was optimistic despite his darkest visions. He was very kind to me personally at a time when I was extremely unhappy, doing my best to hide that unhappiness and trying to remake my life. His circle of friends have all known this great generosity of spirit. As an artist, Michael was utterly dedicated, serious and very industrious. As a translator, he was not interested in theories of translation, but in actual achievement. You could say he subscribed to the just do it school of translation. But he also wrote original poems, novels and plays. He painted and sketched his organic forms, not so much still life as life forms in convoluted motion. His artistic career stretched from just before World War II until the last few days of his life on Earth when he finished his last book. Michael was enriched as an artist by his many contacts with the people and art of the Far East. He travelled as far as, and even further than, Pierre Lotti, one of his masters. And his relationship with his translators was always cordial, helpful and friendly. Serena Jin, my colleague at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, can best speak from the point of view of a brilliant translator of many of Michael's work works. She has published just a few days ago a very lovely translation of Colours, Poems and Drawings and she's got that book with her and I hope a bit later on she will say a little bit. Another colleague, also a friend of mine from many years at UBC, is Jack Stewart. Jack is the author of a penetrating, highly professional, critical study of Michael, The Incandescent Word. This is an apt title indeed. And Jack can best speak of Michael's varied writings and their links with visual arts. The inspired artist Lauriane Latrenoui, who has collaborated with Michael on so many projects, including bright, brilliant and intriguing book illustrations, can probably best speak of his graphic art. I finish with a tribute in the form of a poem I wrote a few days ago for Miriam, Michael's daughter, and for his son Marcus. The title is a kind of Michael Bullock paradox in itself. Snowbird of Summer for Miriam and Marcus. When his bird hands had spread, perched on sheets, on pillows, that then were settled snow, he took off for lands we don't yet know and met eternal summer in a walled and secret place where he calls your names. Eclipsed in his season, he sails now under a moon at the full. In a dream, a swoon of colours that ring fabled orbs where dark becomes noon with stars ever near and ever far, his flash of energy freed to race, now glides, yet never fades, all aflame, becomes thought's blinding beam that swings across strange tongues, alive with images and words that burn in the fire of visions, intuitions to free what in the body had hung. All energy, mapped out of sight, migrates in its seasons, day and night, as he does, and at the speed of light. <laughs>